Harmi, I, we've been talking about uh, Jimmy Anderson and paying tribute to him for years, um, ever since this show started and before that. Uh, it, I mean, it's it, um, the news that Brendan McCullum flew over from New Zealand primarily to to uh, deliver the um, news, or would it be termed a request that he retire after the first test this summer himself in person, 20,000 mile round trip? Um, is a you know just a tiny indication of uh, the esteem with which uh, he is held. Um, I, I I don't I don't know what to say. I've got a couple of questions for you about Jimmy, but uh, first of all, your thoughts. Um, I'm not surprised that this is the final year. Um, I think that I think that that was always coming. I think we could probably say you know over the last few years. We, we, we've had this. We have had that sentence waiting, haven't we? We're not surprised that he's retired. Not surprised that he's going to go. We're probably waiting for it last year, waiting for it the year before, and then he kept getting 40, 50 wickets at twenty one, and in a in a in a summer and or a calendar year, and and you know, consistently shutting the 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 uh, the doubters when I talked about his age up because of the ridiculous skill levels the lad's got. So. I think uh, eventually it had to come. It has come. Um, Brendan McCullum and listening to Jimmy didn't seem to, Jimmy didn't seem to be um, too pleased that it came out as quickly as it came out because obviously they were you know, scurrying around to try and tell family members that it, it, it is the time. It is going to happen, and it's going to happen at fitting ground, which is Lords. I thought I actually thought, and I said a few weeks ago, man, is on this show that. I don't think Jimmy can get to Australia. So if he doesn't get to Australia, the best thing for me would be to go out at Old Trafford. If he could get to Old Trafford, which would be the fourth test match. But I think the sign was, you know, the writing was on the wall a little bit when Chris Wokes didn't get picked in the T20 World Cup, that maybe Nick Wokes would be the one that starts the summer. And if he is, then Jimmy might find it a little bit difficult to get a, to get ahead of him. It's, you know, so that sounds ridiculous because of Jimmy Anderson and who he is, but I'm sure England going for the future. But look, the initial thoughts are we have seen probably the end of, I think, the, the golden generation of cricketers that came out of, of English cricket. The the Cook, the, the the Broad, the Anderson, we're probably just waiting on Root and, and, and Stokes after after that, after the for the next generation that came through. Um, what he's done for for English cricket, Jimmy Anderson has has been amazing, and um, a lot of people thought he might have gone last year. He'd give it one more go in India, where his record was unbelievable. Now he's got a chance to to sign off at Lords, um, in front of what will be five days. Hopefully, it goes five days, because I personally I believe that it's the biggest ground in the country, and it should have the capacity for every single day to send off one of the greatest cricketers that's ever played cricket for England. Um, and that, for me, would be a, a fit and send off that every seat taken because somebody you you need to be there to say I was there when Jimmy Anderson retired because the like will never ever be seen again. I want to ask you about uh, the way in which it was handled. Um, and a word in defence of uh, the brilliant Guardian cricket uh, chief uh, cr chief cricket writer Ali Martin. Um, he he broke the story. It was obviously ahead of when Jimmy wanted it to, to be announced. Um, and he hastily had to ring around all of his uh, friends and, and family in particular. He said that he would have preferred to have told all of his teammates in person. But, um, you know, Ali Martin has a job. And if he heard the news, then um, he, it was, it, he would have been remiss in his duty as uh, the chief correspondent for The Guardian not to write it. So you get your thoughts on that in a moment. But We've got to make sure that we fit in the reaction from uh, another one of his former teammates, former England spinner Graham Swan, who was in great form um, this morning, uh, talking to uh, Talk Sport Breakfast uh, to uh, Talk Sports Breakfast program. I'll tell you what, Swanny, um, to a sort of novice like me in, in, in from the world of cricket, Jimmy Anderson, what made him so special? Why did he get so many wickets? What could he do that others couldn't? I tell you, one of the main things, that you, first of all, let me just say, the one reason I love Jimmy so much, and you just heard it then in his talk, because 
I'm just delighted that I could play so long in the most monotone, boring voice I've ever heard. I've never known anyone so miserable as Jimmy. And uh, honestly, he sledges his own kids at the breakfast table. He is that miserable. But he's an absolute hero. What he did with the ball, basically his, his action, whenever someone changes uh, whether they're going to spring the ball away from the batsman or into the batsman, it's very, very obvious. He was quick enough. Um, that it was very hard to pick through the air. And he did it so... There was no change in his action whatsoever. So Batman just couldn't read him. He was also very intelligent. He's one of the few fast bowlers I've ever met who can spell his own name. Um, <laughs> and so he was very good at thinking out the Batman he was playing against as well. He's an absolute legend. I, I texted him the other day saying, you've had a good career for a little medium pace swinger from Burnley. Well done, mate. Swanee, where does he rank? I mean, and, and, and I'm not even talking about an English cricket. I'm talking about all-time bowlers. I mean, first seam that he had over 700 is absolutely remarkable. He made his test debut in 2003. He's been playing test cricket for over 20 years. Where does he rank in world cricket? Well, first of all, English cricket, he's the best we've ever had full stop. Best bowler England have ever produced yeah. worldwide. I think he's, if you're talking swing bowling, he is the best swing bowler, um, certainly that I've ever witnessed, that my dad's ever witnessed. And he goes back like 75 years. I can't go before that, but obviously. Um, he's not the, the quickest bowler there's ever been in the world. Um, he's got the best um, fitness that I've ever seen. Considering his diet, the five years I played with him was pizza, and chips. He's like Shane Warne. Ah. How they actually manage to keep going. I think he just eats quinoa these days because he's absolutely ripped. But uh, yeah, back in the day when he was younger, he had a dreadful diet. He did train hard, but he just, he, he's got such a sort of single minded approach to cricket that he gets out there and just does his job, come rain or shine. Um, and he's really good at it. There's already talk about his future might include a coaching role. Would he make a good coach, do you think, Swanee? He should immediately be made coach. There shouldn't be any messing around. He is um, the leader of the English attack. Whenever new bowlers had come in, he'd immediately take the guys aside and teach them different balls that he bowls, uh, weapons that he would never have to give away normally. A lot of bowlers would never do that. They'd keep their own sort of skills to themselves um, for job sort of protection. But Jimmy never did that. He's always very good with the young and fast bowlers who come in. I, I think that coaches should go immediately into the team when they're fresh, when they know all the opposition, when they're still current. Um, and I, I would immediately uh, put him in charge of uh, some role of, of the bowlers with England. I think they probably will as well. Knowing Rob Key as I do, um, he's very forward thinking and I think that they'll be desperately trying to do that. That's Graham Swan um, in uh, typical Swanee form uh, and he was speaking to Jeff Stelling and Ali McCoyst on TalkSport Breakfast uh, this morning. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, as you as you said, um, he's got a great sense of humour. Although, when you share a changing room with him, you want to punch him more often than you, than you want to laugh, or, or at least um, in equal amounts. But um, it's interesting, isn't it, Harmy? That that um, you know the the way that it was handled. I always had the sense, to be honest, that Jimmy would be closer to uh, his great friend Alistair Cook in the way that he went out, and it would have been so. He would have preferred it to be low key. Um, instead of which, he's going to have two months talking about his final test match. Yeah, he is. And it's unfortunate that because Jimmy doesn't like talking, to be honest, does he? He's not the one, he's not the most sort of forthcoming with his, his opinions. Well, it depends if, if you're in the, in the team or you stand in mid-off or you dive over one. He, he, let, he, he let you know that he wasn't too best <laughs> pleased. Now, Swanee can you know, vouch for that as well. And Again, Swanee knew him as good as anybody else. Uh, I made my one-day debut, you know, two days after Jimmy Anderson. But, you know, the majority of my career with him in either the team or the squad or, or thereabouts. Um, and he's an amazing man, Jimmy Anderson, who, unfortunately, he has to take the limelight. He doesn't want it. <laughs> he has to take it, though, because of who he is and what he's done. Jimmy will say, all I've done is I've gotten out of bed every morning and tried to be the best version of myself as a person, as a cricketer. Um, and that version of a cricketer, I mean, there's nobody come close in, in English cricket. So he, he, he is going to have to talk about it for the next two months. I played golf with him at the back end of last summer. Goffey was up there. Strauss was up there. We talked about, you know, potentially going, why didn't you go with Stuart and all that? And I'm saying, God, man, it, it, it hurts too much. I can't believe me and Goffey looking at him with our bellies hanging out and, you know, he's 
you know, he's still going in and he just said, I might wake up one morning and I might just say, that's it. I've had enough. And it was like, unfortunately, Jim, you can't do that. You know, we want to tell, we want to, we want to say thank you for what you've done. And that for me is, is what's going to happen over the next few weeks and a a couple of months getting to the Lords. And yeah, you're right. Ali Martin had to make the story. Uh, Brendan McCollum had to go and say in person, whether it was Brendan McCollum, Rob Key, they had to sit down. Yeah, they had to go and knock on his door. They had to put him in a in a comfortable environment, an honest conversation about you know the, the time to move on. Um, it's never hard, but I think for me it would be one of of fulfilment to talk to a guy who has done everything in the game, give everything in the game, um, and unfortunately, um, good news or bad news. Yeah, nobody likes them conversations, but. When it's done right, I think you appreciate it. And I'm sure Jimmy Anderson, when he sits down and reflects on it in two or three months' time when the, when it's all done and dusted, he'll reflect on it was done in such a, a dignified way that um, he'll have no complaints and have the utmost respect for the people at the hierarchy. OK, um, we're going to be amongst the people talking, hopefully, to him and about him for the next two months. So um, let, let's move on. And I just want to say that as well, you've done a separate um, video on uh, the YouTube cricket channel, which uh, people can can uh, can can have a look at and have a listen to. Just a final word, though. Um, what? Why do I find it slightly um, disconcerting that he might never actually leave the change room? <laughs> Let's talk about him becoming a, the bowling a fast bowling coach or a, a bowling consultant. You know, playing the first test and then and then not going home for a couple of weeks or months. Or a year or two, um, I, I I just find it. I mean, surely you'd want some time off after over half of his life as a professional cricketer. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure he does. But he he likes a game of golf, to Jim, and uh, these lads play a lot more golf when they're when they're all together than they do when they're when they're not. So I, I think he might be eyeing that up. He's possibly thinking how much of a great environment that Ben Stokes and Brendan McCollum. He's got a win win in my eyes if he can get that job because it's. It's like what an environment he's he's gone through all the the sort of trials and tribulations and the stress of you know defeats in Ashes and Chris Silverwood and and Ashley Giles and Andrew Strauss before he's now finally yeah hung on till he's forty two year old and he's he's in an environment which he absolutely loves with McCollum and Stokes and why would you want to leave that so he's probably thinking like I'm gonna I could, this could be a win win because I. I can have everything I really want and don't have to go through the the sort of pain of, you know, getting myself fit and ready and bowling as much as I had to. So, look, I'm joking. If Jimmy Anderson, if you can convince him to hang around and you can have him around in the dressing room, why wouldn't you? I mean, why wouldn't you? If you're a young bowler now, you know, the likes of Potts and Pass from Durham, you know, I see Ollie Stone's had a good week. You know, the, the likes of Josh Tung, um, and there's one or two others flying around who you know, are on the radar of English cricket. If they come into a dressing room and have a conversation with Jimmy Anderson, yeah, their 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 education in cricket will will surely be enhanced. So if you can keep him around, and he does want to stay around, I don't see him going into commentary. I don't see him going into the media as such. That he likes that dressing room environment. If he if he if you can hang him around, yeah, and why not? It would be a, a be a great coup for the ECB to keep him around. Yeah, and Ollie Stone scored 90 as well at number nine. You can imagine mm. how happy that made me. Lower order runs, love it. Lower order okay, runs is um... the for. <laughs> exactly. You're listening to Following On here on TalkSport 2 with me, Neil Manthorpe, along with former England fast bowler Steve Harmison. And next up, Daily Telegraph's Nick Holt will join us as we move one step closer to the inevitable private investment in the 100. All right, let's talk money. <laughs> Now, let's talk hundred money, hundreds of money. Uh, Nick Holt, as promised at the top of the show, the Daily Telegraph's uh, chief cricket writer, joins us to give us an update on the sale of the hundred and the salvation of the England game. Uh, The English game will be future-proofed, Nick Holt. The answer to to everyone's financial worries, the sale of the hundred. Give us an update, sir. Yes, I mean, you could probably do this once a week, because I suspect it's one of those things that's going to drag on for a very long time. Uh, it's actually the ECB's AGM today, um, so there'll be a few more discussions around that. But um, 
Well, look, the latest is at back end of last week that there's the non-host ground. So those are the ones that are not uh, home to 100 teams. So that's 11 of the counties. Uh, gave sort of lukewarm approval to the ECB's uh, plan to move forward to the next stage, which is actually going out there and, and trying to sell these things. I mean, that's going to be the next interesting side to this story is who and how much. So who are the people who are going to buy the the, 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 the franchises? How much are they willing to pay? Um, so that, that, that to me is the next sort of really interesting bit. I think we're still going to have quite a lot of horse trading over percentage splits and, you know, sort of things behind the scenes between the counties and who gets what and how much. But really the next stage is who's going to buy the county, who's going to own Lords, who's going to own Lancashire and what are they willing to pay for it? And hold you, who do the counties have? Did they really have much choice? Did they have to take the deal that was on the table? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, they could have turned it down, but I think the feeling is that if they do that, they're, they're missing out on a on a potential windfall that yeah is a, it, that they would never have had in their wildest dreams a few years ago. And some of them are under huge financial pressure, as I'm sure you've discussed on your program many times before. That they 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 need this injection of money, and and costs are rising in the game. Um, inflation and player salaries. Uh, the ECB have got a lot of costs to uh, meet with the uh, recommendations of the ICEC report, which they wouldn't have, which are fair enough, they wouldn't have budgeted for uh, a few years ago. Um, and the women's game is growing, that needs funding. So the, the pressures are on the game to find new ways of investment. And this at the moment is really the sort of only route that they have got. So I think there was always general agreement uh, that this would, this would go ahead. It's just obviously the finer points of the detail and who gets what and how much that are going to be argued over, I would suspect, behind the scenes and in, hopefully, in the press. <laughs> Holti, what about uh, the members? Obviously, 15 of the 18 counties are member-owned and they're concerned about uh, heritage, history, tradition, losing control of their clubs um, or at least their venues while the 100 is on. Um, that is going to happen. Uh, I, I mean, I, you know, if we go, if we take the SA20 as an example, I mean, the the six venues um, have no control at all <laughs> over their venue during uh, the, the SA20. Um, and, you know, you've got one side paying a lot of money and the other side receiving it. So whatever you call the percentage split, um, it's clear that the people with the money are going to control things rather than those receiving it. And these are all the, the valid discussions that are going to be going on. And this is why some of the counties have you know, taken extra legal advice really on what their rights will be going forward. It's not just who plays when and what time of the year. It's it's also deeper things as well, like, you know, future expansion. You know, does a hundred spill over into six weeks? Does it go into seven weeks? We've all seen this with other leagues that they start with four weeks, don't they? And they say, oh, this is great. Look at all these people coming in. Why don't we, I say, well, why don't we play a few more games? Let's make it five weeks. And then, of course, the creep becomes a march. So, yeah, th these are all the things that are going to be in discussion. The county members actually will not have a, really have a say on this. Uh, the, 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 the clubs will make the decision without recourse to a vote for their membership. The only difference probably being the MCC because they have, they are a member-owned club and they don't have a professional team, so they are in a slightly different position. And they're the ones to keep an eye on, I think, because um, the MC, the Lords is obviously the most valuable franchise. Uh, it, it will attract the highest bids. It's the most uh, uh, it's the most prestigious, obviously. Um, but also the MCT are controlled very large, very by and large by their membership. So they are going to have to run everything by the, by the membership. So um, that's going to be an interesting one to watch and could potentially delay things uh, going further down the line. But yeah, you're right. These are all things that, are, that, that, that members and supporters will, will have concerns about. And you know that we we you know, we all understand that the members are sort of out of the equation, but we, me and Manners are quite you know quite good on this show talking about the haves and the have nots. We try and stick up for the have nots as much as we possibly can, because yeah. in my opinion, we need eighteen counties, we need eighteen satellites, not for not for you know the product that they produce on the field, but the avenue they give young players and new juniors and you know the young women cricketers, girls cricketers to come into our great game. Um, how is it important? How important is it that to make sure that deal for the have-nots is right, and the cash that they get is enough to keep them going, as opposed to giving them a little bit, and in the short, if the short term keeps them happy, but potentially in the long term, that gets less and less, and they just wilter away. Well, this is the message job for the ECB. This is why they've got to get this right. This is a, there's no going, there's no second 
digs at this. This is their only chance. And so they've got to get that 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 side of it right. And that means getting the most money they can and splitting it equitably. I mean, if you look at some of the counties, they, they this 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 sort of windfall is something that they would never have had in their history before. And it should it should ensure their future going forward. And I'm like you, I think 18 counties is a strength of the English game that we have these mm. uh, satellites around the country where you can uh, tap into your community and bring as many cricketers through as possible. That is a strength of English cricket. And that, that's why these people have got to get the most money in and, and, and handle this uh, sale process properly and do it the right because they won't get another chance. Colty, has there been any talk at all that you've heard um, about... Um... Can, well, the terms and conditions of of a purchase and investment in the competition um, is the is the USP the fact that it is a sixteen point four over competition, um, or has there been talk about? I mean, what if what if the IPL owners come along like they did in South Africa and their bids were three times higher than any other bids, and there were other bids from from other other potential owners. Um, now, if they came along and said, yeah, um, but it, uh, it, it needs to be a T20 tournament. I mean, it sounds like a very small thing, but it, it wouldn't be a deal breaker, would it? Well, not necessarily, but it wouldn't be a T20 tournament straight away. I, I just, well, the first question you've got to ask, okay, if you make it a T20 tournament, what do you call it? Because you can't <laughs> call it 100, can you? Because it's not, well, what's the point of that? That doesn't, that was, it, it's going, you've got to rename the competition. Yeah, you've got to rename the competition straight away. Um, and if I was the counties, I'd be fighting against that as well, because if you have a 2020 tournament that's got eight teams, that's got all this money coming in, and you can forget the blast, because that's not lasting much longer. That was the whole reason we've got 100, is because they wanted to make it different to the blast. That was done to protect the counties, really. I mean, and the broadcasters wanted it, and that was very important. They want a short two and a quarter, two hour, two hour, whatever competition to be played because it's much better on television. Now, that's probably more relevant, I would say, to the BBC than it is to Sky, and whether the BBC stay involved is a whole new other discussion to have. But um, so, yeah, look, they could come in and demand those things. And if the IPL teams come in and, and offer the most money, then sure, they will be in prime position. But they're telling they're telling us or they're briefing us that they don't necessarily want uh, this to become a satellite of the, of the IPL. They don't want the BCCI having huge control over English cricket in that re in that respect. Um, they want to probably have a maximum of maybe two, maybe three IPL teams involved. Uh, so unlike, you know, other competitions that have, that have fully gone with, with, the, with the Indian or mostly with the Indian teams, they're saying also that, look, we're not going to go for the highest bidder. We'll remind them of this later on down the line, but they're, they're, they're <laughs> not going to go for the highest bidder. It's also they've got to prove to us, you know, that they want to invest in, in the women's game, that they want to invest in grassroots. There's a lot of good publicity around that as well. If a franchise owner comes in and says, oh, I'm going to give 30 million to Yorkshire club cricket to bring through the next generation, they're going to be called whatever, you know, uh, they're going to put their names to that academy. There are There is a good publicity around that sort of thing and, and, and they're protecting their future as well by producing players. So we'll see. I mean, I, Yes, well, they, they say we're not going to go to high speed. We'll, we'll wait and see. But I, I think generally they they will be they will be pulled up at some point by the DCMS by the government to answer all these sort of questions as well. Nick, you I'm just done a change of, of subject there. Just something coming to my mind. We talk about the BCCI and how uh, powerful they are. Um, we've got a few cricketers in the IPL at this moment in time who are being hauled back to play in this Pakistan series. Me and Manners have been of the opinion in the next two weeks. Well, we'll we'll see when it happens, but it looks like it is. How significant could this be if Rob Key turns around to all these players and says, no, you have to come back. You are under contract. I'm not bothered about the BCCI, sir. Would that be the first time somebody's really stood up to the BCCI? Because I can't imagine KKR would be too happy that Phil Salt's coming back. can't imagine Rajasthan being over the moon that Joss Butler's coming back ahead of what is... You know, vital playoff games to go eliminate is to get to the the knockout and then the final. I, I think it's only happening because of the World Cup. So, if this was a Pakistan series and there wasn't a T Twenty World Cup the following couple of weeks later, just they would not be coming back. I think that's mm. that that's why. And I think probably if you look at somebody like Joss Butler um, in particular, he would take he he know they had a poor fifty over World Cup. Um, so they cannot go into a tournament really without coming back and playing Pakistan first. I think they know that this is very, very important for them all um, and that they had to come back this time. 
Um, whether it sets a trend for the future, I'm not so sure. I think I think most boards just don't schedule any cricket now during the IPL, or well, as little as possible, to 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 prevent that from happening. And finally, Nick, again on a different subject, I can't let you go without uh, plugging your excellent book with Lawrence Spooth um, on the the birth of baseball. So how how's that going? Are you working on the uh, the edition two yet? And your thoughts on Jimmy Anderson's last test looming in two months' time? <laughs> uh, yes, with the paperback actually uh, went to press on Friday, I think last week, with an updated chapter from the India tour, which um, uh, I think was entitled uh, something on Reality Check, maybe that m- mentioned, I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, so we've, we've, we've gone to, so it's progressing nicely. Um, Jimmy was, uh, yeah, I, I, look, I, I think... The, the the fact he came back in India after such a difficult summer last year, and he, to be honest, looked like the time was up, and he bowled really well in India at times, and and particularly in the first test he played in Visag was real shy sign of that of Jimmy's immense sort of mental strength and determination to to keep going, um, and and was credit to him really, um, but. Uh, <laughs> It's the right decision. It's a time for Jimmy to move on. It's a time for England to move on. Uh, uh, Rob Key did an interview yesterday in which he said, we've got to find some, teach some people to bowl us to learn to bowl with a new ball. And and, and that's going to be vital, obviously, going into the next Ashes series. And as we know, those Ashes series come out very, very quickly. And I know people say that uh, English cricket's always obsessed with the Ashes, but it's true. And and that's how mm. th- these guys will be judged. They will be judged on how they perform in Australia in 18 months' time. So it is the right decision. They need to bring other people through. Key thing is getting Joffre fit, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just Joffre. I think it's getting many, many other fast bowlers fit. Mm. I got asked the other day, Holti, about what our production line is. Obviously, on talk sport, you do talk about footballers, but and it's all football on this on this station. But we've got some very, very good substitutes who can last 15 minutes. We just struggle with the ones that can go a full 90. Yeah, and I, is that is that a problem with the, the, the system? Is that a problem with um, just the nature of fast? But as you know, you know, the, the, how difficult it is to keep to, to stay fit. I mean, I don't play as much cricket now as I would have done, obviously, when you were playing, and and so. Yeah, we, it, Josh Tung's injured, isn't he? He hasn't played since last summer. And, and if players do come along, they come along very quick, first onto the scene, and then we don't see them for a year. So, yeah, that's, that's the other key thing, is getting them fit. But, think, but you know, key is, Rob Key is very keen to get pace. He's uh, into English cricket and, and working hard on on producing fast bowlers because that is that is the key for England's success going forward, mm. particularly in the short term, because the batting, yes, we know it's up and down. We know that they, they have meltdowns every now and then, but when you think where they were with the batting a couple of years ago to where they are now, all those guys in that top six have played big innings at one point or another against decent sides. Um, that is progress. And we see plenty of young batsmen with lots of talent ready to come through, but it's, it's, it's now, it is now time to, to, to address, to address the bowling. You're listening to Following On here on TalkSport 2 with me, Neil Manthorpe, along with former England fast bowler Steve Harmison. Um, and if you've missed any of the show or you wish to catch up, you can always download the podcast from the Following On feed, available via the free TalkSport app or wherever else uh, you get your podcasts. Let's have a quick look at uh, the county championship uh, then, Harmy. Um, you can pick the stories that have caught your attention. Um, the games, uh, many of them have... have, uh, have um, went the distance actually or went pretty close uh, into day four and just a reminder at this stage that if anybody wants more detailed coverage um, and interviews and uh, analysis on the county championship uh, don't forget the following on county cricketer podcast which uh, comes out which you're on Harmi, um, which comes out on Thursday and there's a more uh, detailed uh, analysis of of what's happening in the county championship but obvious story sorry continue their hunt um, for three titles in a row with a comprehensive nine-wicket win um, over Warwickshire at the Oval. Jamie Smith's 155. That's probably uh, most people's uh, lead story. Kemar Roach showing once again what a brilliant uh, player he's been for Surrey with six for 46. Um, And Jaden Seals, who, by the way, we spoke to last week, for those of you who missed it, um, and that interview is uh, also on the uh, TalkSport um, cricket website, uh, so um, uh, YouTube channel, I beg your pardon. So, uh, do have a look at that. He speaks absolutely brilliant. He was at it again, Harmy, with uh, another five wicket haul uh, for Sussex. And yeah, 
Um, maybe you can start with uh, with those stories, and then I'm going to ask you about Lancashire and your old mate Dale Benkenstein. His new team is making a horror start. Yeah, they are. Um, but no, the, the the obviously the headline is is Surrey and and Jeremy Smith. You know, we've, we've talked about potential number sevens. Is Johnny Besto coming back? Yeah, with the gloves. Is it going to be Phil Salt after having a, a razzmatazz of of um of the IPL for KKR? Holly Robinson at Durham, who is, pardon the pun, the sort of safer pair of hands when it comes to, you know, from a, a, a weight keeping point of view and uh, from a batter who is very aggressive with technically correct. Uh, ben Folks, who will say, why are you talking about all these players when I am the man in possession um, who played in that game? And then Jamie Smith today, oh, this week, has just reminded everybody don't forget me. And I think some of the highlights and some of the you know the shots that Jamie Smith played, yeah, you know, this boy is supremely talented. We've seen that in white ball cricket and he plays really well in red ball cricket. The beauty about our, the, what I like about this man is bat number four. Bat at number four, he challenges himself. He goes in top of the order, high up. When the ball's moving about a bit, if 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 the openers don't get off to a good start. That for me tells me that this boy can play and play properly. So, you know, he has he said, look, yeah, there's a statement. It's a big score, 155. Um, he is a good player. I don't know about the glove work because uh, we, you know, Ben Folks is kept in this game, but I do know that Jamie Smith's been keeping this season along with Joe Clark up at Knotts. Um, and watching also some of the highlights of that, Warwickshire played really well. You know, the batted. Yeah, you know, they've got three and three forty, and obviously got bowled out for, for just under two hundred and ten. But I think they need to work on their off stump because there's one or two that Kemar got absolute beauty. And I mean, to be fair to him, to be fair to the batters, I mean these things are coming back from a, an awful long way. But the skill level of Kemar Roach, especially one round the wicket, left hander, I can't remember who it was, but it came back onto off stump. It boomerang beautifully. And the batter's looking and thinking, I've got this covered, I've got this covered. And then he hears a death rattle. You know, that, along with Jaden Seals, Jason Holder, he's mm. done well for 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 what uh, for Worcestershire. All of a sudden, you chuck Alzari Joseph in the mix or Shaman Joseph in the mix. And it, the West Indies have got an attack that can come to England and give England a little bit of a fright. So, you know, the West Indies are coming with bowlers who have bowled in English conditions. Kemal Roach. You know, Jaden Seals, two of them bowled really well this week. Um, and you know, we talked about the you know, other players who are who have uh, who have done well. Um, but the standout for me this week was was definitely Jamie Smith. Um, just to mention, by the way, that um, Jaden Seals uh, took wickets for Sussex, but Glamorgan beat them, mm. and um, so so terrific win for Glamorgan and Gloucestershire won for the first time since. The end of the 2022 season, September 2022, uh, the 256 run uh, win over North Ants. So um, it's just uh, uh, that's a long, long winless streak. Um, wasn't quite as long as the one that Leicestershire enjoyed a couple of years ago. But um, yeah, good, good stories. Um, and mm. and I hope it's a reflection of good depth. Definitely. And I think uh, Cameron Bancroft is, look, He's got he's whenever anybody mentions the name Cameron Bancroft, you know where the story's going or the, the headlines are going. Unfortunately for Cameron, that will be, you know, what happened in uh in South Africa for, for Australia will 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 stay with him for, for all the wrong reasons. But it's got this guy's a proper player. You know, I, I he's, he's he's talked about in the baton for Australia for a lot, a lot of years. And Whenever he, he sort of hits a purple patch like he did at Durham, like he did at Somerset, um, hopefully that from a Gloucester's fans' point of view or members' point of view, that 130 first championship win for an awful long time might be the catalyst to start something which, you know, Mark Elaine as coach will hope that um, will propel them higher up and keep going higher up. Because when you look at that side, there's a good side in there in Gloucester. You know, Bancroft at the top, you know, Bracey, you know, he, he Fluffed his lines when he got an England cap, but he's still a, a top quality player. Price, another one at the top of the order who is who is th well thought about. Um, they've got pace. I mean, you look at the their their, their, their pace bowlers. The Langer's a good bowler. 
Um, Singh Dill, another another quick bowler. They've got some pace in their side. So, um, yeah, you'd watch for Gloucester. It might be their first win for an awful long time, but it wouldn't surprise me if they go back to back um, in the next few weeks because you know it normally happens when you don't get one for a while. You know, two come in a short space of time, and having Bancroft in a bit of form will certainly help. Yeah, 18 games um, Gloucester went uh, without a win. Um, and finally in this section then, we have to um, mention, well, I want to mention Hasib Hamid, who's captaining Nottingham, uh, Nottinghamshire at the moment, um, setting up their victory with an unbeaten 247, carrying his bat. Uh, I, I've always had a soft spot for him. Um, and, you know, the the way that he's come back from from adversity and a, and a se- serious... Um, loss uh, loss of form. I mean, you know, that the extended like beyond a year. Um, the way he's rebuilt his game is is absolutely commendable. Um, Nottinghamshire beating uh, Lancashire um, by uh, nine wickets. It was um, at Trent Bridge. Um, so, so what what is what what is going wrong for um, Dale Bankenstein and Lancashire? Any idea at all? I'm not sure. I really, I can't put my finger on it. I look at the Lancashire side and fair play, before we get into that, fair play to Knotts. You know, they've, they've started the season not too badly. They've got players in a bit of form. They've copped against, they've come against some good sides who have played just better than them. You know, they've, they've put scores on the board. You know, Clark's had back-to-back hundreds and still didn't win. So in the early parts of the season, and then Hamid, again, yeah, you know, 100% concur what you just said about the lad coming back to form um, against his old side in, in Lancashire. Ollie Stone this week talked about it earlier, getting you know lower order runs. He got 90, but he got three wickets and he bowled overs, which is great to see because I think Ollie Stone has, has got something as a bowler, just unfortunately, like many others, can't keep himself fit. But Lancashire, you literally just can't put your finger on it. Um the one thing I will say about this side, and it'll sound like I'm defending my mate Dale Benkenstein as as a as a coach. Uh, he's just come into the into the group. He's got two, three year contract. I look at that Lancashire side, it's a young side. It is a really, really young side. They've got three or four wiki keepers in the team because they're all, you know, competent batters. And the, I think if you stick with it, I think you'll see the tide turn. The problem you've got is with young players. If you put them all in together at once and they're constantly getting beat, then you've got an issue. So like that would be the happy balance from Dale Benkenstein's point of view and the Lancashire hierarchy's point of view is you've got Wells, who's been around a little bit, and Keaton Jennings. But you look at the rest of the young leader players that go with it. You know, Bahannon has played you know quite a bit of cricket, but he's still relatively young. So is Balderston, so is Bruce, so is Bell, so is Hurst. Hartley's Again, you know, you look at what he did for England, but he's still, you know, a relatively inexperienced first-class cricketer. Um, Saki Mahmood's just come back from a a long, long layoff. So, yeah, are they short of a little bit of experience? Hopefully, in the in the big league, um, they can you can learn quickly. They got a good score this week. They just weren't able to, you know, finish the game off. Three hundred and thirty in the first innings. It's not a bad score in the in a, in a first class match in England, but unfortunately, I think some of these young lads thrown in all together might be what's not holding them back, but not having the experience just to you know pull it all together in that middle order might be what's the, you know letting letting Lancashire down. So let's let's wait and see. But it's been a horrendous start for Dale Benkenstein at, uh, at Lancashire. It has been, and all I would say to conclude this section is that I'm sure the players are very relieved to be playing some first-class cricket in spring conditions. It'll be a real treat when they get to play in the actual summer. Um, You're listening to Following On here on TalkSport 2 with me, Neil Manthorpe, alongside two-time county championship winner Steve Harmison. Next up, we'll round up the week's other stories as Ireland shock Pakistan and the problems go from bad to worse for Lancashire. Uh, now, um, Nathan Johns joins us once again, um, the cricket writer at uh, the Irish Times. A great deal to talk about once again, Nathan. You know how much Harmy and I like uh, the uh, Irish boys and, and Irish cricket. So a victory on the field, I have to say, um, a, a very impressive one. And um, 
I thought they might have made a, a better fist of it in the second T20 against Pakistan as well, having posted 193 for seven. But uh, they got well and truly beaten there. So as we speak, that series squared at 1-1. Um, but it's been overshadowed, Nathan, again, by events off the field. Um, and I was reading a story the other day about uh, Ireland, I Irish players refusing new contracts from Cricket Ireland and, and, and potentially going to the T20 World Cup as uncontracted players what else going on now yeah as always it's 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 never dull uh, in irish cricket circles uh, for a small sport on this island it uh, it has its share of of off field a significant share of off field problems um yeah look i think to say that the the the, the victory on friday was overshadowed it might be it might be a little bit harsh because a lot of the players chatting to them afterwards you could kind of sense this was kind of extra sweet because of the contract stuff. And it it kind of, it did give Irish cricket a good news story about what that was badly needed. It was in the headlines for the right reasons for, for a weekend or so. Um, but the long story short on the contracts is uh, come November, December, when it became clear that Ireland was getting a significant hike in ICC funding and the players union, the Irish Cricketers Association, uh, who negotiates their contracts on behalf of the players, went to Cricket Ireland and said, can we have more money, please? Because I think there's been a general sense that through COVID, the players put up with a lot. They were travelling in bubbles for, for a couple of years and and playing in some what were pretty dark times and, and tough mental health times for players. And they never kind of, there was a little bit of outcry, but nothing ever serious. They never asked for any pay rises. And, and, and as a result of those matches and COVID support grants, the sport survived financially in Ireland. And now they're kind of saying, right, now you've got more money. We've been carrying the can for so long it's it's time to to reward us so to speak and i think cricket ireland was sympathetic to those to those desires but then which we spoke about in the last time i was on all the various different financial events that have occurred from about march onwards to the tune in there you know they've got basically nearly two million less than they thought they were going to get um the, the i think that there are still pay rises on the cards but just not as much as as players want and it kind of all came to a head nearly two weeks ago now and yeah we, we broke the story the day before um the first T20 that the men, the male players had rejected uh, the offers of the central contract offers that were made. Um, and presumably it is in relation to those, those pay rises. The women were at the qualifiers, the World Cup qualifiers at the time. So they haven't actually made a decision yet on their offers. I understand they make theirs earlier this week. Um, I've been told it's kind of touch and go with whether, whether they'll accept or not, but uh, yeah, players are, they're not playing on uncontracted. The, 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 the contracts expired in, in March, uh, 1st of March, um, they're just still playing on last year's salaries, but they obviously want so they can still get injury cover and all, all that stuff. Um, they obviously just want those contracts to go up. The big concern is there's a World Cup in a few weeks time. When are they going to get time to, to negotiate? And there's every chance to go to a World Cup playing on out of date contracts. Uh, just before Gumby comes in here, um, Nathan, I just want to say when I said I read a story, it was, of course, your story. <laughs> Thank you. So the, just to get this straight, they're playing on last year's contracts. They're still negotiating for this year um, and they're likely to go to the World Cup without any sort of resolution or solution to that. It, it how depends health, on how... Can, sorry, how healthy is that for a team environment? Well, they've actually been remarkably healthy. I mean, uh, they finally had to speak about publicly about it, the players, because the story came out and obviously everybody started asking them about it in the build-up to the... The, the Pakistan series and then on Friday afterwards we, we spoke to the players and you know they've obviously there's a party line that the, the, they all say the same thing we're sticking together uh we back the the union we we stand in solidarity with them they have our best interests at heart so they're, they're remarkably unified and, and to be fair they have deviated slightly from that party line Paul Sterling kind of said he's remarkably proud of his players for how they they haven't let this type of stuff boil over and um, there might have he says there might be a little bit of frustration inside the camp but if you take him at his word he says you know they're still being professionals and they're still going out there and uh and, and they want to win games of cricket i mean andrew balberni after he scored a match winning 70 on on friday kind of came out and said yeah look we're, we're together on the pitch we're together off the pitch and we crossed that white line all we care about is cricket and um, in a way i actually think cricket ireland are, are fortunate that the nature of the players is that they're, they're i don't think they're ever going to get to a stage where they're ever going to refuse to play because they just love playing too much so that drastic step, which might prompt 
some moving or grease the wheels a little bit probably isn't going to happen just because the players ultimately care most about playing for Ireland and and money is secondary. But like to be clear here, these guys don't get paid well in terms of the broad spectrum of international cricket. Like, you know, I think as far as I understand, there's only one player in the squad who's on more than six figures. Everyone else is from anything to 30 to 60,000 uh, euro a year, roughly, give or take. So it's not like they're you know, these guys should, their market value elsewhere is a lot higher than they're getting. So I think they're just looking for that to be, uh, to be reciprocated. But no, look, it's, it, it's definitely frustrating. I, I know the players find it incredibly frustrating, but as ever, you know, there's always bad news stories in Irish cricket. There's always fixtures being cancelled, which is, of course, is, is earning opportunities and match fees that are going down the drain for players. They've had to put up with stuff like this for years. It hasn't come to a contract uh, dispute for years, but they have, they have a lot of practice at ignoring stuff that's going on off the pitch and just going out and trying to win games of cricket. Finally, Nathan, um, are the players really all, all you know sticking together? The, the the haves and the have nots. I mean, are they are they one for all and all for one? Because you know, when um, players from Australia and and South Africa um, and, and to an extent New Zealand um, fall foul of their administrators, you know they they can always say, well, we'll just go freelance. Then we'll just go and play franchise cricket all around the world, and. Apart from Josh Little, who got a very large amount of money by Irish cricket standards anyway from the IPL, and and there are two or three others um, who could who could uh, play franchise cricket for, for lesser sums of money. But it's in everyone's interest, isn't it? I mean, the administrators and the players to to stick together and to and to work things out, and you know, and not to to have fallouts. Absolutely. Um, for the most part, I think all the players are certainly very united. I mean, look, you mentioned Little. He he is somebody who I think a lot of some pessimistic voices would look at and go, yeah, he's he's the biggest candidate to, to go freelance. But I think that discounts the value he places on playing for Ireland. Yes, he's not playing for Ireland at the minute. Um, he's still with Gujarat, uh, even though he's he's sitting on the bench at the minute. He's only played he's only played one game in the IPL this season. Uh, he won't be available again for Ireland until the World Cup. But uh, he's look, he, he's going to have a lot of franchise opportunities over the next two years. But as far as I understand it, he's still desperate to play for Ireland and will will play for Ireland as much as as much as he can. Um, I, I don't think there's any inclination that he won't take up an Ireland contract at the minute. Um. But obviously, you know, so he's the that that one concern. But apart from that, yeah, everyone is is united, and even he, I, as I assume, is united in that case. Um, obviously, when they're talking publicly, they're only going to talk about being united. But even from, you know, just what what you hear from behind the scenes, etc. I think generally the players are fully focused on you know getting getting what they want and and I don't know exactly what the dispute is whether it's around salaries or match fees or bonuses or, or what have you um but in terms of on the administration side it's look it's it it, it is a really it's, it's not a good look I think for the administration I mean, I don't think this is greedy players um I don't think this is players going trying to take every penny they can from a union which obviously is is cancelling fixtures and is and is struggling for finances um I don't think it's as far as I understand that that's that's not what's going on here. I, I don't know why there is the gap um, between what's going on, but uh, you're right. It is in everybody's interest, which is why it's certainly in in Cricket Ireland's interest for this to, to to be fixed up quickly, whether they have time, because if the players are consistent, they won't talk while they're playing matches. And they pretty much got matches from now until the World Cup. I think there's a few days. There's a gap of about five or six days, maybe, where, they, where they're not traveling or, or playing. Um, so is that enough to get these contracts over the line? I don't know. Nathan, just finally, just a quick one from me. It, it is important that you mentioned what you just mentioned there. It's not about greedy players because we're talking. We're not talking about huge amounts of money. We've seen this so many times with the West Indies and the West the Pakistan and going into major tournaments and stuff like that. This is not greedy players in Irish cricket. You know, holding big administrators to, to ransom. These are these are players who have have done over and beyond to do their best for island cricket yeah exactly and and, and to be fair I, I haven't actually seen any any commentary uh along those lines to, to be fair to the players um i there's nobody within the organization on the administration side who is who is saying that as, as far as i can tell or at least they haven't said that to me um so yeah no i i completely agree with that and it's also worth remembering i mean there are at least three or four players i mean uh the, one particular example in the last year or just over a year, I can off the top of my head, I can think of two players who played Test cricket for Ireland on contracts that don't actually give them salaries. 
their casual contracts that just give them match fees per DMs and injury cover. Um, Matthew Humphreys, the young left arm spinner, was one, and PJ Moore opened the batting at Lords, and he was last year. And he was on a contract like this, so this isn't greedy players. Like there are guys who literally don't get a salary. Um, but so it's it's I think when that's the context, you're absolutely right. You, you, it's very very hard to to not look at the what's going on and 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 not have some sort of sympathy for the players. The excellent Nathan Johns, cricket writer at the Irish Times. Now then, let's uh, move on to any other business, Harmy. Uh, I've got a long list of uh, stories here, but uh, we've got very little time. So um, I'll, you can um, pick and choose a couple. I just want to mention the England women, 11 for four in the first uh, game against uh, Pakistan and uh, won it easily in the end. Um, T20, uh, the first uh, of three. Uh, so c- congratulations to them. I'm not sure whether you watched the game. Um, Rahul Dravid was told by BCCI Secretary Jay Shah that he could reapply for the job if he wanted to after the T20 World Cup. I rather suspect that he won't, given that he had to be talked into uh, a contract extension of six months in the first place. And West Indies have confirmed three ODIs and three T20s against England at the end of the year in Antigua, Barbados and St Lucia. And I spent the last 20 years talking about context. International cricket needs context. It needs test championships and ODI championships. Well, the context of that is to make some money. And it's one of the few occasions where I think good on them. Good on England's fans. You can, I mean, what that's Antigua, Barbados and St. Lucia. Um, you know, and, and money for West Indies cricket, which is, is desperately needed. So that's what caught my eye. Anything for you? Yeah, yeah. The West Indies cricket desperately needs it. Um, you know, we we spoke to the you know, the great you know good man last week in in Jaden Seals and talked about and I talked to um you know the the obviously the, the contingent that came over from Barbados the other day, a big Joe Garner, even Bradshaw talked about you know the money in the islands and what it needs to go to keep them the bigger players who are from franchise, uh, from franchise cricket and all sorts, and and the England coming is massive. It's huge. So to send them to you know the more favourable grounds where you are going to get a lot of hardy makers, you are going to get people to come and watch. The grounds are going to be full. The atmosphere is going to be fantastic. Um, no better place than Barbados, Antigua, and St Lucia. So that'll be good. Hopefully, we might get a chance to go out there, manners. But I'm not so sure. Talk sports budget will. Get to that, but hey, we can live in hope. Um, yeah, I don't think um, I don't think um, Raul Dravid will will continue. Um, even though Jay Shah's, if they were desperate to keep him, I think they might have been saying, "Well, there's another contract rather than you know reapplication." Um, and it was, it was a great turnaround from the the um, the England women's team. Yeah, you know, eleven for four, they really were, and Heather Knight, you know led that team very, very well. So that looks a very, very good series, I think, England against against Pakistan. Um, and yeah, I think, but the highlight for me was the uh, the announcement of the West Indies trip, which is sandwiched between a tour to Pakistan and a tour to New Zealand, which I know we're going to the latter part of that trip. So, you know, fingers crossed, we have some, you know, some pleasant cricket in between. Okay, and just before we come on to the final word, and this really has got to be a 30-second thing, we have for the last couple of weeks speculated very strongly that Phil Salt and Joss Butler may not actually play in the T20 series against Pakistan um, because of the pressure applied to them by the Kolkata Knight Riders and the Rajasthan Royals. However, uh, you have heard a whisper on the grapevine that they will, in fact, um, be playing for England rather than in the playoff matches for their IPL franchises. And I'd just like to speculate, I'd like to make it clear that it is speculation, that uh, that reflects enormously well on them because I don't think that there'll be much doubt that their IPL teams have applied as much persuasive tactics, otherwise known as pressure, uh, for them to stay. So I think I think if they do play for England, it would reflect enormously well on on the the character of of those two. Yeah, character of those two, character of all the players, but especially them two because of what they've done to get their teams probably into the knockouts. I think Phil Salt and Josh Butler especially have been shining lights when it comes to overseas players in that tournament. So yes, 
you know, fair play to them as an individuals. So fair play to the, all the, the the overseas that are coming home, England or Pakistan. Obviously, Pakistan aren't in it, but that's the series that's on at this moment in time, or that's talked about. Um, and fair play to Rob Key, because Rob Key has basically said, you've got a contract that supersedes anything to do with IPL, and you are coming home. And the minute he says that, they've got no leg to stand on. And I think because of that, I think, you know, fair play to Keezy. If this happens, you know, I'm, honestly, that I think it's a, it's a good thing that somebody stands up to India. But it's also a good thing to the to the dressing room and says to the dressing room, I've given you what you want in times gone by. You know, you've missed you know, Caribbean tours, you've missed you know, Pakistan's tour, you've missed other tours to prioritise, making money in franchise cricket. Now we need you because we need our build-up to be spot on to get to the Caribbean and America to try and defend our world T20 um, crown. Now I'm telling you, I need your home. And I think if he sticks to that, and that does happen, not only is it fair play to the players to taking it to taking that on board and saying, right, you know, we this is going to be our team, but the administrator and Rob Key especially, you know, hats off to you if you can if you can stand up to India, as not many do. Good on you. All right, uh, the final word, um, and I've got two this week. Um, the first one you know about, Sean Udall, uh, hmm. Shaggy playing in a match at uh, Dummer Cricket Club. He's been brave, courageous and very public um, in his uh, battle with Parkinson's. Um, tweeted a couple of days ago that uh, he played a match at Dummer Cricket Club, um, scored 22, took a wicket and a catch, had a great lunch and bowled an over pain-free. So Brilliant. after the tragedy of last week's uh, final word, I thought um, we'd... Um, have a smile this week. Yeah, I, 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 that man is a hero in my eyes. I, you know, you remember, you see it. He's on his Instagram or on Twitter. There's a picture of him in his England England shirt. I'm standing right behind him, head down. I mean, we must have had a bad day because I, I would say we had a bad day because I, I had a little bit of a frown on my face. I probably just bowled a few overs. <laughs> but to play alongside Sean Udall, who was 40 at the time, when he came back into that England test team in, in Pakistan and India, um, I love him a bit. What he's going through, you know, breaks everybody's heart because he's a fighter and he's fighting Parkinson's. Like he fought to, to, to have the longevity in his career in county cricket, like what Jimmy Anderson. Jim, he was in his well into his 40s and he was still lifting trophies, like to Hampshire and Middlesex. He is a great, great man. He's having a charity do in a few months' time and we're trying to support that as much as he can from Parkinson. So good on you, Shaggy. It was a great week for you and, and keep up the good fight because you know there's a there's a tough man in there who's fighting very, very hard against illness and a disease which um is is not pleasant. Okay. The final final word. Uh last week we also discussed um Andrew Flintoff's boys and uh, their uh, feats for Lancashire second eleven. And I made a joke that uh, they were doing a good job of um Hogging the or or, or or hogging the heart, the limelight, taking the limelight away from Charlie Harmison. I don't know how your boy feels about um, being in the in the spotlight and being the the son of of you, um, but he's um, he's going to have to get used to it if he starts scoring hundreds of forty four balls or carries on scoring hundreds of forty four balls. I was watching it on the stream. And I got to that Berwickwear, and the the signal went off. So I didn't actually see him get his hundred. He's he's little me, me brother's lad Lennon, who is who's actually only about two years younger than him, but he's about four foot shorter than him. Um, <laughs> Charlie's been sleeping in a grow bag for a long time, but no, no, it was nice. Yeah, I was playing for a you know Ashton's Academy side, which is a Sunday side, which is basically a, a an extension of juniors with a few adults slash first second team. So it was nice to see him get. Get a hundred on a on a on a good ground. Tyndale's a, a good ground which has had the likes of Ian Bishop and and Courtney Walsh as their overseas players over the years. So um no, mum and mum was proud of him. Um I was from afar. Um and it was obviously it's good for the cricket club because you know the more and more kids that are doing well. Um we we play in a good standard of cricket up in this area. Um, and it's getting harder and harder to get juniors up to a level of that that standard of cricket. So, you know, while he's doing well, I was uh, very, very pleased to see. 
Um, you've been listening to following on here on TalkSport 2 with me, Neil Manthorpe, along with former England fast bowler Steve Harmison. Um, and if you have missed any of the show or you wish to catch up, you can download the podcast from the following on feed, as always, um, available via the free TalkSport app. We'll be back at the same time next week when uh, new Pakistan head coach, or at least uh, white, white ball coach, Gary Kirsten, will be amongst our guests. But uh, for now, it's been another edition of Following On. On AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app and on your smart speaker. TalkSport.